Oh, man. The Seattle Seahawks, well, they were a yard away from tasting the rainbow for a second straight year. All they had to do was give it to their beast. At least you would have thought so, right? Instead, Seahawks head coach Pete Carroll elected to throw a slant pass to Ricardo Lockett, and it was intercepted by New England rookie Malcolm Butler, sealing a 28-24 Patriots victory in Super Bowl 49. We all know the script by now. That's my fault totally, Carroll said of the strange play call after the game. Marshawn Lynch, who carried the ball 24 times for 102 yards and a touchdown in a bulldozing performance toting the rock, didn't get his chance to reach the end zone after powering for four yards the play prior. Rather than giving it to his all-pro running back, Perrell went to a receiver with 18 career receptions. It was only a couple hours earlier that Carroll reaped in the rewards of a courageous decision. Seattle faced the first and 10 at the New England 11 with six seconds to go in the opening half after Lockett snagged a 23-yard reception and Patriots cornerback Kyle Arrington was whistled for a face mask. Carroll elected to take a shot in the end zone. And Wilson connected with Chris Matthews on a back shoulder throw in the front left corner to tie the game at 14-14 going into the break. Except nobody's going to remember that play call anymore. Nope. Nope. That's just the way it works sometimes. But you know what? It was somewhat extraordinary for the Seahawks to be back in the Super Bowl in the first place. They got off to a less than impressive 3-3 start but finished 9-1 to obtain home field advantage throughout the NFC playoffs and shocked the Packers in the final few minutes to get back to the big game. Now Seattle will attempt to become the third team to reach three consecutive Super Bowls, joining Miami 1972-74 and Buffalo 1991-94. Including the postseason, the Seahawks are 30-8 and their last two years, the best mark in the league. And they might have gotten even better in the offseason, with the trade of Jimmy Graham, who was obtained from New Orleans for Max Unger in a first-round pick. Seattle also acquired a fourth-round selection from the Saints. All the key pieces are back and then some. Russell Wilson signed a four-year, near $88 million extension, and Bobby Wagner will play in Seattle for at least four more years as well. That vaunted defense, raucous stadium, genius coach, consistent running game, and improving quarterback provide all the key ingredients to make another run at another ring. So, before I go position by position, uh, I've got all the units ranked below. I've got all the players, got numbers besides each one. So, make sure you check that out. It's in the description box below. If you got any problems with any of my rankings, well, let me know in the comments section. Debate me. I love debates. So, let's do it. All right, going by position now, I do believe that Wilson is a bit overrated. I still think he's an ascending quarterback who has the chance to be elite. But he's not there yet. His accuracy wavers at times. He'll sail balls along the seams. And he had some pretty awful, awful performances last year. Obviously, we all remember the Green Bay game. But he was also bad against Carolina, Oakland, Dallas. Pretty much the whole first month of the season. Now that we've gotten the not-so-good out of the way, let's talk about what I do like about Wilson. I love all the intangibles that he has. The it factor that I look for. He's a leader, and despite the clunker games he tends to have, he always comes through in the final minutes. Got it. You guys want a guy that wins? Well, he wins. I love that he uses his athleticism and mobility not to scramble, but to buy time and extend plays. His improvisation under pressure is amazing to watch, and he always keeps his eyes downfield. He's a perfectionist. He always strives to get better. His 849 rushing yards were the fifth most in NFL history. Marshawn Lynch led the league in broken tackles. That shouldn't surprise anybody, recording an incredible 88 of them. They call him Beast Mode for a reason. I, I even went back and, and watched his majestic touchdown run against the Arizona Cardinals and counted eight whiffs. He, I mean, he just barrels through people. He's run for at least 1,200 yards and 11 touchdowns in each of his past four seasons and recorded a career high 367 receiving yards in 2014. The Seahawks just signed Fred Jackson as insurance, and Robert Turbin is solid as well. Christine Michael was just traded to the Dallas Cowboys. On to the receivers, who are vastly, vastly underrated, and, and it's reflected in my rankings below. I mean, uh, the addition of Graham is, is the one that, you know, puts them over the top. I have the Seahawks number four in my receiver rankings. Pretty crazy. 
Uh, I'm, I'm sure some of you may, you know, Seahawks haters aren't going to agree with me, but I think there's a lot to like here. You know, it's 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 not that they have a go-to guy, that, but they don't. But but there's solid, you know, threats all the way around. There really is, and Graham is going to be that safety blanket for Wilson. So Doug Baldwin, Jermaine Curse, Ricardo Lockett, that's a solid trio. And I really like the third round rookie, Tyler Lockett. Baldwin runs crisp, precise, precise routes from both the outside and the slot. Curse had a plethora of highlight reel catches in the playoffs, and Lockett is a speedster. Chris Matthews and Paul Richardson are also guys to keep an eye on. Matthews is the guy who came out of nowhere to catch four passes for 109 yards in the Super Bowl, while Richardson came on late his rookie season, but tore his ACL in the divisional playoffs against Carolina. As you can see, no elite receiver, but a lot of depth, a lot of options. I can definitely see the Seahawks using a bunch of two tight end sets with Graham and the emerging Luke Wilson. Graham averaged 11 and a half touchdowns a season during his time with New Orleans. He's a huge threat in the red zone, boxing out defenders as if he's boxing out, you know, uh, rebounders. Uh, he's a big target, also good at reeling in the back shoulder pass. Um, I'm, I'm curious to see how he does blocking because, you know, it's, it's kind of a power running game. The Seahawks like to run the ball a lot. Is he going to be able to, you know, block? We'll see. Uh, Wilson is a downfield threat, but he does drop a lot of passes as well. The offensive line is a mess. Wilson would have to scramble for his life at times. Former Pro Bowler Russell Okun hasn't been the same player over recent years due to a rash of injuries. I'd say J.R. Sweezy is probably the team's most consistent lineman. He's the starter at right guard and a former defensive lineman. Uh, the other, other starters are up in the air. It appears that Seattle will go with Gary Gilliam at right tackle and move former former tackle Justin Britt to guard, or left guard. There was a three-way battle at the center spot to replace Unger between Drew Novak, Lemur, Lemuel Jean-Pierre, and Patrick Lewis. Novak won the job. Lewis was the starter of the final four games, while Unger was sidelined due to injury last year. Uh, Jean-Pierre was recently released. Moving on to the defense, which led the NFL in fewest points allowed for a third straight year, allowing just 15.9 points per game. Since former defensive coordinator Dan Quinn is now in Atlanta, the Reigns will go to promoted defensive backs coach Chris Richard. Most of the attention is focused on the Legion of Boom, but Seattle's front seven is pretty good too. Michael Bennett and Cliff Averill are the two starters at defensive end. Bennett led the team in sacks with seven, while Averill tallied 20 quarterback hits. Bennett's never had more than nine sacks in a season over seven years of service in the NFL, but since Super Bowl 48 against Denver, Bennett has taken significant strides forward. And getting back to his sack numbers, he did tie for the league lead among 4-3 uh, defensive ends with 53 hurries. The reason why he doesn't get to the quarterback more is due to how you know opposing offenses attack the Legion of Boom. Most of the time, they'll utilize a quick, short passing game. Obviously, that makes it harder to get to the quarterback. As a pass rusher, Bennett can disrupt and get pressure as either a three technique or a defensive end. He's powerful, plays with great leverage, and very quick off the snap. He is, you know, he was straight up unblockable at times last season. Uh, Bennett is also solid against the run. He uses a, that aforementioned uh, quickness to get off blocks and make tackles. So, you know, Bennett was a top five defensive end in my in my rankings, which you know may may surprise the non Seahawks fans because you know the problem is they just look at his sack totals and you, you just can't do that. Um, you know, like, like I like I just stated, uh, I think it's how opposing offenses you know attack their defense, and and that's why uh, he doesn't have those gaudy, to gaudy totals. But when you put, turn on the tape and you watch him play, the guy's elite. He's really good. So there's that. With the contract extensions to Wilson and Wagner, Tony McDaniel was released. But I do like Jordan Hill, although the team has DeMarcus Dobbs listed as a starter at left defensive tackle. Brandon Meebane is the starter on the other side. He eats up a lot of space and does all the dirty work. Atiba Rubin was brought in as, as well to be a part of the rotation. He's been a starter for most of his seven-year career with Cleveland. Wagner's undersized at 6 feet, 240 pounds, but makes up for it with speed, instincts, and intensity. It's amazing how he still tends to be underrated among the rest of that elite defense. I mean, he's, he's just a forgotten name, I guess. I, I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I think, you know, behind Luke Keekley, he's the best inside linebacker in the game. When Wagner went down with a turf toe injury in Week 6, Seattle went just 3-3 three and three during his absence, but finished the year on a six-game winning streak following his return. 
His instinct, speed, and great leverage makes him a stud against the run. He notched 74 tackles and just seven misses a year ago. In coverage, he's equally adept. He gets great depth, will knock off his receivers off their route if they cross the middle, and tackles well in space. Bruce Irvin and K.J. Wright are a solid pair at the outside linebacker spots. I actually like Wright a lot. He led the team in tackles with 107, but is in fantastic in coverage. He has great range, does an outstanding job of covering tight ends down the seam. Irvis, Irving, Irvin has made a seamless transition from defensive end. He's a good tackler and has done a solid job in coverage. The guy that I really like out of the outside backers is Kevin Pierre-Lewis, fourth-round pick last season. He flashed as a rookie in limited playing time last year. So, you know, with, with all these contracts being thrown around in, in Seattle to, to keep the you know core intact, if, if K.J. Wright or Bruce Irvin you know, walk in the next couple of years, Pierre-Lewis is going to be a solid you know, replacement, I, I think. Richard Sherman was my top right corner for the uh, third time in as many seasons, and uh, he's going to have uh, another starting cornerback starting opposite of him uh, for the third time in as many seasons as well. Kerry Williams will be getting targeted often. The lanky 6'3", 195 pound Sherman was thrown at just 65 times a year ago in 989 snaps. When the ball does come his way, he uses his length and soft hands to make plays on the ball. Four interceptions on 65 targets is pretty good, and he was penalized just three times all year. The quarterback's passer rating when throwing at Sherman was just 48.4, the third best in the league. Due to his height, he can match up against taller and bigger receivers, but his technique is also so exceptional that he can shut down the smaller, more elusive wideouts as well. There's a reason why Seattle's nicknamed, you know, the Legion of Boom. Earl Thomas and Cam Chancellor aren't the only ones who can lay the lumber. Sherman can hit, too. He puts that length to good use when wrapping up ball carriers. Williams is long, aggressive, and fits the press-covered scheme that Seattle likes to employ. He got a bad rap last year in Philly. He, You know, I, I didn't really think he was as bad as many made him out to be. So, uh, there's that. Uh, Jeremy Lane and Marcus Burley are solid, but Lane might be out until midseason due to knee injury, due to knee surgery. Therald Simon and fifth round rookie Ty Smith are also in the mix at cornerback. Thomas topped my safeties list because he's equally great at stopping the run and being in coverage. He's fiery, smart, athletic, physical, and extremely confident out there on the field. At 5'10", 208, Thomas is the smallest member of the Legion of Boom, but that doesn't mean he can't lay the boom. He launches himself like a missile at ball carriers. I mean, I love watching him hit. His closing speed and range going sideline to sideline is by far the best in the league. I mean, seriously, watch him close on a back and a flat. It, it seems like he's, you know, most of the time he's there before the ball is. He's simply the best in space and rarely out of position. In coverage, he's athletic enough to run with any receiver in the game. If you want to see how athletic uh, Cam Chancellor is, go watch that Carolina playoff game and watch him leap over the line of scrimmage on a field goal attempt, not once, but twice. Pretty crazy for a guy who's 6'3", 232. His trademarks are his big hits. I mean, he is in the Legion of Boom. So not only is he you know, physical in the box, he can also plays, make plays off the edge. Now, I, I know I said, uh, you know, um, lost my train of thought there. Okay. Um, in, in my safety rankings, you know, I, I, I thought uh, Harrison Smith is the best in the business at stopping the run uh, from the safety spot. Um, but, but I think Chancellor is right up there, too. So, so those are the top two guys, I think, stopping the run. In coverage, um, I mean, you better watch out to go over the middle. Uh, he, uh, I mean, he, he's just going to lay the boom. And, and he also has the athleticism to play tight ends up the seam. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, with Chancellor and his, his contract situation, there, there's been reports that he may be traded. So, so we'll see what happens. I mean, he's asking for a lot of money. He deserves a lot of money. It's just can Seattle really afford to, you know, give him that? Considering they just locked up Wagner and, and Wilson. So, uh, you know, we'll see. Stephen Hauschka is one of the more reliable kickers in the game, while uh, John Ryan is solid as well. Doug Baldwin will handle the kick and punt return duty. So, there's that. All right, prediction time. You know, uh, I, I think Seattle is by far the best team in the NFC. I, I don't, you know, with the with the loss to Nelson, uh, uh, um, Jordy Nelson with Green Bay, I don't think the Packers are, are really, you know, there ready to take them on. Um, I like the Eagles a lot, but I don't think the Eagles are ready to beat Seattle. Uh, you know, the... 
what's going to matter is is the motivation. We we saw last year, you know, that Seattle got off to a slow start, and you know they they kind of flipped the switch in the second half of the year. I don't know if they can afford to do that again. Um, you know, they they finished twelve and four. They they kind of lucked out into into getting the home field advantage, and for them, the home field advantage is paramount. I mean, they they produce the most crowd noise in the league with the the way their stadiums built. So, I mean. They get home field advantage in the playoffs. They're not going to lose, and uh, you know for that to happen again, they got to get off to a better start. So, so we'll see if they can. You know, uh, they had the Super Bowl hangover, like I said last year. We'll see if it happens again. Um, yeah. So, I think Seattle's going thirteen and three. I think they're the best team in the league. I don't see anybody beating them in the NFC. So. I think they will be in the Super Bowl again, and uh, you know we'll see if they can actually win it again this time. So uh, there's that. Uh, make sure you follow me on Twitter at the Bitter Birds. I'm Adrian Fake. You, I'm out of here again. Debate me below. You know, let me know in the comments section what you think about my rankings and where I have the Seahawks going this year. Uh, I'm sure I won't get much of a debate because I'm sure the Seahawks fans are like me and think they're the best team in the league. So there's that. I'm out of here. Later.